In 1980, I decided to investigate the historical evidence for Jesus. After 21 months of research, I came to the conclusion that Jesus is the unique Son of God and that Christianity is true. Nearly 20 years later, I began another investigation that really put my faith to the test. After I became a Christian in 1981, I realized pretty quickly that even though this was the most important decision I'd ever made, it was only the first step in a long spiritual journey. I mean, I was excited about my new faith, and I had this picture of it just growing progressively stronger and stronger. But I discovered that the Christian life isn't always a smooth road. In fact, at times it can be more like a minefield, loaded with many of the same objections and doubts that I had when I was a skeptic. And these doubts are inevitable. I mean, to some degree, we're all going to have them. The question is, how will they affect us when they hit? Are we drawn closer to God through the experience, or are we pushed away by uncertainty and confusion? Many years ago, I came across the story of a prominent Christian leader whose confrontation with doubt dramatically changed his life. His name was Charles Templeton. On March 18, 1946, Charles Templeton, a pastor from Toronto, Canada, and his close friend, William Franklin Billy Graham, boarded a plane for London, England, and a historic series of Christian meetings. Decades later, Templeton reflected on their friendship and ministry together. Billy and I met in the spring of 1945. It was backstage at a Youth for Christ rally in Chicago. The stadium was packed, and, and as Billy was being introduced to preach, he leaned over to me and he said, pray for me, Chuck, I'm scared to death. Well, that started a friendship that has lasted for over 50 years. Templeton and Graham were soon preaching at Youth for Christ rallies throughout North America. Both shared a passion for the same message, personal salvation through Jesus Christ. In the 1940s, Youth for Christ was a North American phenomenon. The atmosphere was informal and upbeat, and thousands of young people flocked to the meetings. The movement soon attracted worldwide attention, so a team was selected to take our message to Europe. For five weeks, Templeton and Graham traveled throughout the United Kingdom, France, and Scandinavia. They shared the pulpit preaching on alternate nights to large, enthusiastic crowds. When they returned home, many believed that Templeton would go on to become the most successful evangelist of his generation. Yet, despite the effectiveness of his ministry, he found himself facing what he described as a growing dilemma. In the months following our return from Europe, I began to fight a losing battle with my faith. I'd been so busy that there was little time to take stock of my life, but in those occasional quiet moments, the doubt started to surface. You see, I had converted to Christianity as a teenager, and I, I lacked the theological training necessary to support my beliefs when those inevitable questions hit me. I wanted very much to believe. I had an intense longing for relationship with God. But slowly, against my will, my mind and reason began to challenge and sometimes refute the things which were most important to me, the central beliefs of the Christian faith. 
Templeton's doubts attacked the core of his deepest convictions, gradually eroding his belief in the validity of the Bible, the deity of Jesus, and the existence of a loving God. My faith was disintegrating. I didn't have the theological training to deal with the questions that were troubling me. So, in a desperate attempt to find the answers, I decided to return to school. In the fall of 1948, Templeton enrolled at Princeton Theological Seminary. After three years of study, he accepted a position with the National Council of Churches. In the next few years, I moved across the United States and Canada, conducting 15-day preaching missions. Everywhere we went, we set record attendance. My days were filled with excitement, but I dreaded the nights. For at night, that was the time when the fears would set in. I would oftentimes break out into sweats, and my heart was, was pounding. I, I thought it was gonna shake the bed. I had to ask myself, what right do I have to stand before thousands of people and try to convince them of something that I no longer believe? It was a reprehensible thing to do. So I had to stop. I had no possessions except a car and $600 in cash. And I would be cutting myself off from all of the wonderful friends that I had made in those years in the ministry. I felt like I was betraying all of them. But in the end, there was no real choice. So I packed everything that I owned into a rented trailer, and I started back on the road to Toronto. Templeton remained in Canada for the rest of his life, working as a writer and news commentator. In 1996, he published his final book, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. What happened to Charles Templeton? Why did he abandon the faith that had once been the cornerstone of his life? I was fascinated by his story, so in 1999, I called him at his home in Toronto. I remember that he answered the phone with his very rich, deliberate voice. I told him that I was a writer, and I wanted to interview him about the reasons he had for rejecting God. And he said, well, I'm not doing very well physically, but yes, if you'd like to come up to Canada, I'd be glad to talk with you. So I was on my way the very next morning. When I met him at his apartment, he looked weak and frail. At first, I didn't think he'd have the strength to talk for more than a few minutes, but he insisted that I stay. He was very cordial, very kind, and I liked him immediately. I could sense that his mind was sharp, and he really wanted to tell me his story. He reminisced for a while about his years in the ministry and his friendship with Billy Graham. It was obvious to me that their relationship was still very important to him. And then, after a few minutes, he turned the conversation to his reasons for rejecting Christianity. He described several common objections, and he had a long list, but a couple of things really stood out. He looked me right in the eye and asked two rhetorical questions. In a world with thousands of religions and gods, why is Jesus the only way to salvation? Are we actually supposed to believe that only the Christians have it right? And then with even more intensity, he asked, how could a loving God, the God of the Bible, create a world filled with evil and suffering. He wasn't looking for a response. He just wanted me to understand these issues that had troubled him for almost 50 years. We talked for another hour, and then I said goodbye. As I drove back to Chicago, I thought about his story all the way home. He was on his way to becoming one of the greatest evangelists of the 20th century, but his faith was destroyed by doubts that I'd struggle with myself. I wish I could have given him some satisfying answers. I really wanted to help him. And I also wanted to know that my own faith could stand up to the tough questions that had ruined his. You know, I think that's the moment I decided to launch another investigation. 
During the next six months, I travel thousands of miles to interview scholars and theologians and ministry leaders who had confronted two of Templeton's major objections to Christianity. Why is Jesus the only way to God? And how can a loving God allow evil and suffering? When I left for my first interview, I remember feeling a little bit apprehensive. These were questions almost everyone faces at some point in life. And the answers aren't only difficult and controversial, they're also crucial to our perception of God. Are we to believe only Christians are right? After all, Christians have the audacity to say that there is only one God, theirs, and that the gods of every other people on earth are spurious. The Apostle Paul stated bluntly, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you may be saved, for there is salvation in no other such an insufferable presumption. Charles Templeton wasn't the only one who felt that Christians were narrow-minded and wrong to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. When I was an atheist, I'd often get angry about what seemed to me to be blatant arrogance. Who do Christians think they are? Why can they judge everyone else? Well, today my perspective has changed, but this idea of there being only one way to God is still one of the biggest obstacles to Christianity. More than two billion people, about one third of the world's total population, identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. At the center of their faith is the controversial and remarkable claim Jesus made the week before his crucifixion. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What was he saying? He really was saying there's only one way to the Father. No man comes to the Father but through me. Now, he doesn't say this in a vacuum. It isn't like this is something he just dreamt up there at the Last Supper. This is something that he's been saying in many different ways all the way through his ministry. The truth of the matter is that before Jesus came along, no one was claiming to be the exclusive, exclusive manifestation of God on earth. This was not only a shocking claim, it was a scandalous claim, and early Jews were not expecting it. You know, it's not a surprise to me that Jesus got himself crucified. What's a surprise to me is that he lasted for three years in public ministry before that happened, making the kind of claims that he was making. It's certainly a difficult thing to bring up in polite society that, that Jesus might be the only way to God. It can bring up rancor and it can bring up uh, uh, bad feelings. But at the end of the day, the question is, is that true? Today, Jesus' claim to be the exclusive path to God is often challenged by the assumption that all religions teach basically the same thing. And as a result, there are actually many ways to salvation. The world religions do agree about some of their surface teachings, but when you get to the core of those religions, they are radically contradictory. Buddha was an agnostic about whether there was a god. In fact, a major strain of Buddhism does not believe that anything exists, much less God. Hinduism says that there are 330 million gods. Islam says that there's one God, and the greatest evil that can be conducted is to believe that God is a trinity and Jesus was the Son of God. For Christians, that is the most important claim. Now, they can't all be right. They could all be wrong, but they can't all be right because they contradict one another. 
I mean, think about it. Christians say that Jesus is the Messiah. Jews say that he's not. Either Jesus was the Messiah or he wasn't the Messiah. And if he wasn't the Messiah, the Jews are right and the Christians are wrong. And if he was the Messiah, the Christians are right and the Jews are wrong. But under no circumstance can they both be right. As one person put it, all religions are basically the same, except for the area of God and salvation and the problem of man and the afterlife and that kind of stuff. It turns out on the big issues, they're very, very different. They can't all be true. While the theological differences between the world's major religions are glaring, individual believers, be they Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, or Jew, share a universal need. They have each experienced what the philosopher Pascal called a God-shaped vacuum in the heart which cannot be filled by any created thing. In dealing with religious studies at the graduate level, uh, one thing we, we were pretty certain of, scholars across the board, that, that maybe human beings ought not to be called homo sapiens, you know, the, the wise man, but rather homo religiosus, right, the, the religious man. Well, why is that? Because no matter where you go, no matter where you go, there is this religious upwelling. Human beings have a sense, deep down and across the board, that they are in some way not right with the universe. What they're really sensing is they're not right with God. They sense their guilt, alienation, separation from God. We hunger for a purpose and a meaning in life that goes beyond us. We need empowerment to live the kind of life we know we should, but we can on our own. Jesus's identification of these problems and his solution to them is more profound than any other religion. This is why Christianity makes so much sense, because it offers a solution to the genuine problem. And it doesn't sugarcoat it, it doesn't candy coat it, it doesn't look past the real problem, it identifies it for what it is. It is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. All have turned away. They have together become worthless, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Throughout my research, I was struck by how clearly the Bible identifies humanity's most fundamental spiritual need. We're all separated from God by our sin because he's perfect and pure and holy, and we're not. None of us has lived up to our own standard of morality, much less to God's, which is infinitely higher. And because the justice of God is also perfect, this separation should have lasted for eternity. But there's hope. God didn't just leave it at that, though he might have, out of love, he reached down with a rescue effort. And the rescue effort wasn't just to toss some teaching our way and hope that we would live better lives, but the effort entailed, and this is where Christianity is absolutely unique, the effort entailed God becoming a man himself to communicate in the most clear form possible his intentions and desires and to make a sacrificial provision for pardon for man's crimes against God. Jesus is the one mediator between God and human beings that can be man standing in the presence of God and can be God standing in the presence of human beings. He's the only God-man. He's the only God-man who can fulfill that role of bringing rapprochement, reconciliation, healing to the relation, the broken and severed relationship between God and human beings. What Jesus did then was to take the penalty for the crimes of men upon himself so that human beings could be freed. He took the rap for their crimes against God. Not only does God come down to reach out to man, but he gives him a free pardon of his crimes. The solution to the problem is not in making man better. Okay, let's make up for past deeds gone bad. Now that isn't gonna work. The solution is grace. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. 
for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Among the world's religions, the Christian doctrine of grace is absolutely unique. You see, grace means that there's nothing we can do ourselves that qualifies us for salvation. Outstanding moral behavior or a lifetime of good works, they're not going to get the job done. That's because God's forgiveness is a gift that we can never deserve and we can never earn. The grace of God is a way of referring to the fact that when God loves us, when God does good things to us, when God sends Jesus Christ into the world, when God gives us his spirit, this isn't as a reward for something that we have earned. Uh, it isn't because we have twisted God's arm. It is simply because God loves us and he loves us lavishly and he wants to make that lavish love a present reality in our lives. God is not looking down at the world at different religious clubs, the Muslim club, the Christian club, the Jewish club, the Hindu club, and he's not saying, you know, I like the Christian club better to hell with the rest of you, quite literally. No, he's looking down at humanity who is desperately wicked compared to his standards, who desperately needs to be rescued. And he offers a pardon and he gives people an opportunity to either accept it or reject it. And this is why Jesus is the only way because he's the only one who solved the problem. Suppose God knew that there was only one necessary and sufficient means to take care of the human dilemma. That would be sending his only begotten son. Well, if there's only one sufficient means, please don't send me the pretenders. And if there's only one necessary means, we don't need any other ones. Why would God want to send 1,500 avatars or savior figures, none of which can completely do the job? What's the point of that? When he can send his son and it's accomplished in one person at one time through one set of events once for all. And that's the essence of why Jesus is the only way. He's the only sufficient and necessary means by which we may be saved. The uniqueness of Jesus is magnified when his specific claims and teachings are compared with those of history's other religious leaders. There is no other great religious leader who ever claimed to be uh, the direct way to God in the way Jesus claimed it. The Buddha certainly didn't. Most Hindu gurus and leaders don't do that kind of thing. Uh, Mohammed certainly didn't do that. He would have thought that to be blasphemy. You could take Buddha out of Buddhism and you still have the teachings of the Buddha. Or you could take the prophet out of Islam and you still have the Quran and the teachings there and the supremacy of Allah. But if you take Jesus out of Christianity, you don't have Christianity anymore because Christianity is not based on the teachings of Jesus. It was rather the person of Jesus that is critical. If you boil him down to a bunch of thou shalt and thou shalt not, you've trivialized Jesus. You've trivialized the essence of his claim because his claims are not just, you need to behave better. His claims are that God is breaking into human history through himself and coming to change us. The gospel, the good news, is that the kingdom of God, the divine saving activity of God, is at hand in the person of Jesus. And you'd better pay attention, because if you don't, all of the ethical teaching of Jesus is not going to do you a whit of good. You have to respond to the good news about Jesus who's come into this world. In his classic book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis explored the identity of Jesus and the popular opinion that while he was a great moral teacher, we cannot accept his claim to be God. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic 
or else he would be the devil of hell. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. When someone says Jesus was just a great moral teacher, that's rather like saying, you know, Mozart wrote some rather pretty tunes. <laughs> just say, well, yes, he did write some pretty tunes, but if that's all you can hear in his music, then you need to sit down and learn what those symphonies are really all about. And saying Jesus is just a great moral teacher is a way of disinfecting him, of saying we can have him on our terms rather than on his terms. And actually, Jesus is not easy to grasp if you do it like that. That's like saying the only bit of the Mozart symphony that I'm actually going to think about is the bit that I can whistle on my way home from the pub. Well, best of luck. <laughs> Strobel's investigation also drew him back to the historical evidence he had first examined as an atheist. Ancient documents and biographies that confirm the events of Jesus' life and the claims he made to deity. The four New Testament Gospels leave no doubt that Jesus believed he was the only way to God. So the issue is, can we believe Jesus? This is where his credentials become so important. And there's a wealth of historical evidence that I've studied for almost 30 years. We've got older documentation and earlier eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life than we have for any other religious leader of antiquity. In addition, we have hundreds of years of scholarship that upholds the validity of the Gospels. Unlike anyone else in history, Jesus fulfilled dozens of prophecies, including the location of his birth, key events of his ministry, and the details of his execution. And each of these prophecies was first written in the Hebrew Scriptures centuries before he was born. Jesus also performed miracles, often in front of his enemies and skeptics, that demonstrated his supernatural power over nature, disease, and death. And if all that wasn't enough, he was resurrected from the dead in an historical event that was confirmed by more than 500 witnesses. You have to remember that the early followers of Jesus gave their lives, they went to martyrs' deaths, not because of sincere belief they held, and about which they could be sincerely wrong. No, they went to martyrs' deaths because something they actually saw with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. They saw Jesus risen from the dead after he was executed on the cross. If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless and we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. The Apostle Paul, who was an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus, felt very secure to say, guess what, guys? If Jesus did not actually come back from the dead in real time and space, our faith is worthless. You see, that sets Christianity up to be testable. You can actually investigate it at that point to find out whether it's true or not. You can offer evidence. You can offer reason. I've studied the resurrection, as you know, very intensively, and I've, I've written about it. And the more I look at the resurrection of Jesus, the more, A, I'm absolutely convinced it happened as a reality within our own space-time world. And B, it is utterly unique. Nobody else has led the way through death and out the other side. Christianity is based from the beginning on the fact of the resurrection. And that's what I've staked my life on. After considering the historical evidence for Jesus' life and resurrection, along with insights of New Testament theology, I was convinced that Jesus is the only way to God. But what about people like my friend Charles Templeton? Those who feel that Christians are arrogant to believe that this is true. What could I say to them? 
Now, of course, some people will always say it's arrogant because that is an easy charge, especially because some Christians behave arrogantly. They really do. The thing about arrogance, though, it's so silly, because if, as Paul says, everything we have is a gift of grace, we haven't got anything to be arrogant about. It isn't that we've got it all together. It's somewhere that God's got it all together, and we are privileged to be called to be a little part of that. And as long as we keep that perspective, we will cut the root of arrogance and be able to bear humble but clear witness to the truth. Christianity has been defined as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And I think that's a wonderful illustration. We were sinners living in rebellion against God. And we found forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ. And we just want to pass this truth on to the rest of the world. The way to any truth is often narrow and specific. And because of his sinless life and divine nature, Jesus is the only one qualified to pay the penalty for our sin. He alone can reconcile us to God. And that's why when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We can trust him with confidence and with humble and grateful hearts. What has been called the problem of evil has puzzled men and women of every generation. Why in a world created by a loving and omnipotent God are suffering, disease, and death inevitable facts? You see, a loving God could not possibly be the author of the horrors that uh, continue every day and will continue as long as life exists. It's an inconceivable tale of suffering and death. And because it's a fact, it is obvious there cannot be a loving God. Cannot be. Early in my career as a journalist, I covered a lot of stories involving people who were living in extreme poverty and horrible conditions, or who'd been the victims of crime or terrible accidents. So I saw a lot of pain and suffering firsthand, and this became an issue that really resonated with me. Later, during my investigation, I commissioned a study that asked a cross-section of Americans, if you could ask God any one question and you knew he'd give you an answer, what would you ask? By far, the most common response was, how could there be a loving God with so much pain and suffering number in one. the world? So I knew that this was the number one objection to the Christian faith. What a lot of people don't realize when the problem of evil comes up is that everyone has to deal with it. This isn't just a problem for me as a theist. Every human being walking the face of this earth is aware of evil in the world, and everybody has to, from their perspective, from their worldview, offer a solution to it. The real question is who has got the best answer in the context of their worldview? Which worldview has the best resources to help deal with this problem? And here, I think, the biblical worldview excels. To understand the biblical view of evil and suffering, we must first consider an apparent contradiction in five core beliefs of Judeo-Christian theology. 
God exists. God is all good. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. And there is evil in the world. It appears that there's a conflict between uh, God's goodness and God's power. If he was good, he'd want to get rid of all evil in the world. And if he is powerful, he'd be able to. But evil exists, and therefore, he's either not good or he's not powerful. That's a pretty good argument. And I think the only way of answering it is to show that the terms are ambiguous. We don't fully understand what God or good or all-powerful or all-wise mean. We partly understand them. So we have to make some distinctions. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. You are exalted as head over all. There's a lot of confusion about what it means to say God is all-powerful. Many people think that means God can do anything. But the Bible is very clear that there are a lot of things God can't do. For example, the Bible teaches that God cannot swear by a name greater than himself. The Bible teaches that God cannot lie. It isn't that God just chooses not to lie, it's that he can't lie. C.S. Lewis once said, can a mortal ask questions that God finds unanswerable? And he said, yeah, quite easily. Um, is yellow square or round? And how many hours are there in a mile? And uh, if you extend that a bit, yes, God can't make a square circle. So there are all sorts of things that God can't do because they'd be illogical or nonsensical. So when we talk about God being omnipotent, what we mean is God can do anything power can do but we don't mean God can violate the laws of logic and do something contradictory. God's power and the existence of evil are prevailing themes in the opening chapters of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. According to the Bible, after God created a universe and a planet perfectly designed to sustain life, he crowned his work with human beings, man and woman, endowed with spirit and soul, free will, and the capacity to make their own moral choices. God created a world in which there were morally free creatures. Human beings can be bad and they can be good. There's a possibility for great evil, but there's a potential for great good when you have moral freedom. And so our greatest blessing, which is the free will we have, the, uh, the, the ability to make choices, moral choices, also is our greatest curse because I often choose the wrong thing, and so does everybody else. And people get hurt out of that, both intentionally and unintentionally. If God creates human beings with the power of free choice, he may foreknow what they're going to do, but he can't determine what they're going to do. Otherwise, they're not really free. And evil entered the world when people freely chose to withhold doing the right thing and instead did the wrong thing. It appears an airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, tower number one, is on fire. The sheer magnitude of evil and suffering in the world can be overwhelming. And while searching for answers, some have argued that because God created humans with free will, then he's ultimately responsible for evil. It's even been suggested that God created evil. But from a biblical perspective, is that even possible? No, because evil is not a thing. Everything God creates is good. God created the world good just as it was supposed to be. But human freedom then 
was used in such a way as to diminish goodness in the world and that diminution, that lack, that missing goodness, that is what we call evil. So evil is a lack of goodness. It is goodness spoiled. You could have good without evil, but you can't have evil without good. And so evil was not a direct creation of God. It was the result of humans exercising their freedom. So if it was the free will of human beings that actually caused evil, then I think it's reasonable to ask, why didn't God just create a world where moral freedom didn't exist in the first place? That way, evil and suffering wouldn't exist either. God could have made a world without evil by just taking away our free will to do it. It would have been very easy for him to just simply say, well, I'm going to make you all marionettes and we'll pull the strings and everybody prays five or six times a day and everybody does right. But God wanted a race of tested individuals who choose to love him. And you cannot love someone unless you have the choice to not love him. The sort of love that humans can give to one another and to God is something which depends on them being able to do it from the bottom of their heart without being forced. As soon as it's forced, it's not love anymore. And so it was a good thing for God to create creatures with freedom because that opened up the possibility that they could actually express genuine love not only to him but to one another in intimate relationship. Sixteen hundred years ago, St. Augustine wrote, Since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. Theologians and scholars have long pondered and debated this question. Does a loving God use evil and suffering to accomplish a greater good? I don't know why suffering can't be compatible with God's love. People have this idea that real love rescues from all pain. I ask people when they raise that issue, I say, are you a parent? Do you have children? Do you feel that your love for your children requires you to rescue them from every bit of pain? Have you never let them struggle through a difficult thing on purpose for a good reason? Of course, there's an impulse to rescue our kids. We don't want them to suffer egregiously. But there are times when we know that it's appropriate to let them suffer in the circumstances for their own good, because a greater good is in view. And we have clues in our own lives. I think almost all of us can look back at some suffering in our past life and say, while I was in this, I didn't understand why God allowed it. And it was a real threat to my faith. And now that I see, that it made me stronger, I do understand it. For more than 40 years, the lessons and struggle of growth through suffering have played out daily in the life of Johnny Erickson Tata. In 1967, Johnny, a 17-year-old high school senior, severed her spinal cord in a diving accident, paralyzing her body from the shoulders down. When I was first injured, I uh, imagined myself as a kind of a human guinea pig lying there on my striker frame. I was doing nothing but eating and breathing and sleeping and really just existing. And I thought, and here you know, most people out beyond these hospital walls are going to college, getting married, having children, going to work. And I'm just lying here sleeping, breathing, eating. And I realized, oh my goodness, upon my life, all the truths of the human race are gonna be tested. Is there a God? Does he care? What's the purpose in life? And if there is no God, then why not have my girlfriend slit my wrist? Why not take my mother's sleeping pills? Why not end it all? I mean, who can face a life of total paralysis? And somewhere in there, in my anger and frustration, I realized life's gotta be more than just getting born and growing old and then dying. There's got to be a God who cares. We're too significant. There must be meaning in all of this. I don't think I would have asked those largely life questions were it not for my suffering. In the decades following her accident, Johnny's life has been marked by extraordinary accomplishment. 
through her artwork, music, books, conferences, and radio and television programs, she has inspired millions of people throughout the world. In 1979, she founded Johnny and Friends, an international ministry that has taken the love and hope of Jesus to the disabled and their families. Through it all, she has intimately known both the pain of suffering and the presence of God. There are a lot of people who think I'm a strong person, and I'm not. I am such a weak person. I wake up in the morning, and honestly, I think, oh, Lord, I don't have the strength for this. I am so tired. I am so tired of this paralysis. But when I start to feel overwhelmed, I'll say, oh, God, I have no strength for this day, but you do. I have no resources, but you do. May I please have your resources? May I please have your strength? I can do all things through you if you strengthen me. Please let me borrow your smile for the day. And honestly, before the morning has hardly begun, I've already got a perspective on the day. I've already got peace in my heart and a mission to accomplish. And it's because I've been pushed up against God. And God has shown me some deep things about his purpose and himself that for me um, are so satisfying, so pleasurable. I wouldn't trade the wheelchair for anything. To ask why a good God would allow suffering is to ask why a good doctor would uh, put a needle in the backside of an infant to inoculate him. The infant doesn't understand it. All he knows is that it's horribly painful. He can't understand that, in a way, this inoculation is going to prepare him for something in the future that he's not even aware of. And in the same way, um, God is a God of intention. He's got a purpose and meaning. And everything he puts his hand to is brimming with intention and meaning. So we can rest assured that although the purposes for suffering might be hidden from us in this present life, his reasons are always wise, they're always specific, and they're always good. Perhaps the supreme demonstration of God's use of suffering and evil for good was revealed in the death of Jesus. Crucifixion was invented a few centuries before Jesus. It is widely recognized as one of the most horrendous forms of death that any state could sanction against an individual. It was so horrific that Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified. So it's no surprise that there is a buildup of the forces of evil, if you like, shrieking at Jesus, attacking him, criticizing him, until finally they nail him to a cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There, two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land and Jesus cried out in a loud voice my God my God why have you forsaken me and he suffered the Bible tells us great emotional and spiritual agony because he experienced separation with his father and he experienced the actual sin of the world in his own conscious life and what it was like to feel and experience that evil and hurt. 
it's the worst thing that ever happened. Three hours of darkness. God himself dies. Inconceivable. Did God allow that? Sure. He allowed the devil to creep into Judas Iscariot and Pontius Pilate and Herod and the cruel Romans and allowed the, the worst event in the history of the world. Why? For the greatest thing that happened to our salvation. That injustice was redeemed by an all-wise, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. He could take those kinds of things and he can turn them in to the greatest goodness imaginable, the salvation that would be available only through him. And only when we see that in the light of the entire longer story do we say somehow this was how God, as it were, drew those forces of evil onto one place in order to defeat and deal with them there in order to make a new creation beginning with Jesus' resurrection. And that's why ultimately we have hope. So an unspeakable evil was transformed into an unspeakable good through God's wisdom. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. If it can happen on such a magnificent scale like that, if you can see in that one case how great evil can produce great good, if God lifts the curtain just a little bit so you can see behind the scenes there, it's at least possible to believe that that principle is at work everywhere. This is so spectacularly wonderful that it gives us the hope that evil will never be able to be the last word about us. That there will always be a way of finding something good that while the evil was still evil, it can redeem it and keep it from triumphing over us. And Jesus answered, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's a powerful statement. Jesus is acknowledging that because of the acts of humanity that open the door to evil in this world, we have pain, we have suffering. He doesn't try to cover it up. It's an inevitable part of life. And yet he tells us something else in that passage that's even more important. He says, I have overcome the world. You see, we have real hope. Hope that's based on the central doctrine of Christianity. God became a man and entered directly into the suffering of the world. When God became incarnate in Jesus, we are told that Jesus experienced the very same kind of heartache and suffering without sin, I admit, but Jesus was finite and he was subjected to thirst and hunger, to aggression, to hostility, to tragedy. And when Jesus stretched his hands out on the cross, he was saying, I love you this much. I love you so much it hurts. I love you so much I'd rather die than live without you. And those nails that went through the palms of Jesus went straight into the heart of God. There's a wonderful hymn which we sometimes sing, which has a line, and when human hearts are breaking under sorrow's iron rod, then they find that self-same aching deep within the heart of God. And that's a wonderful sense. God in Christ has been here. He has taken it. He knows what it's like. He is not unable to sympathize. He is on all fours with us. I mean, Jesus was the most God-forsaken man who ever lived, so that he might in turn tell us, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. That tells me God feels, he empathizes, he cares about my pains. He, he felt the sting in his chest first, and that encourages me when I hurt. In 1944, Corey Tamboom, a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp, considered the full measure of God's participation in the suffering of humanity. 
While clinging to life in the shadow of ultimate evil, she concluded, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. There's a famous passage in Elie Wiesel's book, Night, where he recalls uh, being in a concentration camp and seeing uh, a line of people being hanged and a little boy is one of the people being hanged and he's so light that he doesn't die immediately because his neck doesn't break and he's dangling there half dead and half alive and the crowd are being forced to watch this and somebody suddenly says where is God where is God and somebody else says there he is he's hanging from that noose that's the answer to the question that's often asked, where was God in Auschwitz? Where was God in, in Darf? He was there. He was in the gas chambers. Yes, the incarnation means that he descends into the whole of the human condition. God is there at the heart of the mess and taking the worst onto himself. That's what we believe when we think about Jesus. And that's why ultimately we have hope. It makes me feel there's a certain kind of kinship that God gets it, that God understands. He's been there. He doesn't just have the facts straight. That's omniscience. He has entered into the experience of it, and that's something entirely different. He knows exactly how I feel. There is no pain that I'm going through paralyzed. He was even paralyzed on the cross. That tells me he identifies, and that for me is enough. The Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering was perhaps best summarized by the Apostle Paul. Two decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul described the persecution Christians endured and the hope that sustained them as they preached the gospel throughout the first century Roman world. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He refers to these things as momentary light affliction. What, Paul, are you crazy? Momentary light affliction? Well, we understand when we read further, because he goes on to explain that these are momentary light afflictions in comparison to something else, because these afflictions, and he's very particular about his words, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And you see, there's this subtle theme through the New Testament that helps us understand this problem of evil as followers of Christ, that God can cause all these things to work for good in our lives because we love him, we're called according to his purpose. And these have a transforming impact on us so that when we get to heaven, we are actually different people than we would have been if we had not gone through these things these momentary light afflictions are producing for us the eternal weight of glory. If you only lived this life four score and ten and then you died and that was the end of it, the kind of hostilities and hurts that we have in this life would be writ large. Their significance would be stunning indeed. But from the vantage point of life forever with God in heaven, the harms and hurts that happen to us in this life, though still real and still important, are shown to be so insignificant compared to the glories and the joys we're going to experience in the afterlife, that from the vantage point of that perspective, they are well, well worth it. In 1998, I was at a conference and met a young man named Mark Herringer. Mark was from Boston, and we became good friends. One night we were driving to the airport, and he told me about a tragedy that his family had suffered five years earlier. I'll never forget Mark's story, because it demonstrated so powerfully the importance of what the hope of heaven can really mean. A 
It was January 16th of 1993. In Boston, it snows a lot, and so you're shoveling your driveway constantly. We had gone to the uh, supermarket that morning, and while we were at the supermarket, it was actually snowing. So I got home kind of irritated and said, uh, honey, why don't you park the car out in the street here? Uh, I'll just uh, clean off the driveway. And our two kids were with us, uh, our son, uh, three years old, and our daughter, uh, Lauren, who was 18 months old. I jumped out of the car, got a shovel, the kids jumped out with me, and I asked my wife to move the car to an to a, a easier spot for us to clean out the driveway, and she did, and she said, make sure you keep an eye on the kids. And my son immediately went with her into the car, and my daughter was with me uh, for a few moments, uh, but what I hadn't realized was that she actually wanted to be in the car also. And so as my daughter was running to the car, she uh, was uh, trapped under the front wheel of the car. There was a brief uh, scream of pain, and, uh, and I immediately ran out, and uh, to any parent's horror, uh, they see their 18-month-old uh, daughter under the front wheel of a 2,000 pound car was overwhelming. She died instantly, as we found out later. Um, I actually took the uh, last breath that she ever breathed on this earth out of her lungs. And we um, drove to the emergency room at the hospital, hoping and uh, praying that things might be different, but they weren't. And um, within an hour or so, they had pronounced her uh, dead. I was very angry at God. I didn't know why he would uh, choose me. And my mind would race and think, what is this all about? Where am I going? What does this all mean? Do I take my life? Do I uh, go through a divorce? We had a 97% uh, failure rate within the first two years when there's a death of a child and the parental uh, involvement. Um, what would that mean? Would that, would that bring some closure to that? What would be a life of anger and despair uh, at God? Those options are, are not good ends. The struggle during our pain here was I had to make a decision. Am I gonna accept or reject this situation that I'm in based on not knowing the end game or not knowing the, all the answers? I was given a Bible, my very first Bible, on Christmas, three weeks before uh, the accident. And that Bible was to become the thing that kept me alive. There were drugs and uh, various things that people gave us to try to calm us down during this difficult few weeks, but it was actually holding the Bible and reading it was the thing that actually comforted me the most. Um, I actually slept with my Bible for about nine months every night. What I was struggling for was the reality of Jesus, the reality of somebody who knew suffering, who was going to be there, who uh, had experienced this himself. I spent a lot of time actually in cemeteries just walking around and uh, found some comfort there. I could oftentimes connect more closely with pain there because I knew that everybody there had a story and that people uh, had come and grieved there. It gave me a clarity that Jesus works powerfully in places where people are hurting. And so I found great comfort to just be quiet and listen to him there. And so um, sometimes I would just go around and read the, uh, the, the stone markers and um, uh, pray for the various families. And it actually turned from, a, from an internal thing where I was trying to get uh, healing and hope to a place where I would actually intercede for others. And that was a shift that occurred where God began to do a work that uh, my healing was going to be uh, more complete in helping others. We had five neighbors who lived next to us, directly next to us, when the accident happened. And within five years, three whole families of those households came to know Christ personally. And when I think back on where we were and how God used that, I said, that doesn't make it all right, that doesn't make it good, that doesn't make my pain go away, but it does tell me that God is bringing some good out of this, that there'll be some eternal good that comes out of her life and death. Your answer at this tough time is you are naked, you are stripped down raw, you have to make a decision. Which road are you going to take?
Where are you going to go in your faith? And I think evil and suffering drive us to those points where we have to make those naked decisions. We have to make those um, raw decisions that give us nowhere out, no, no, nothing to hold on to. We're just there before him. And that's what real faith, I think, is. Not knowing the future, but understanding enough now to make a decision that will change the future in our lives. If I look at it through my own experience, I think I would drive it to the point to say that God is in control of all things and nothing is beyond his reach, nothing is beyond his ability to control. The joy is, is knowing that this is just temporary, that there's something much more. The eternal perspective changes things because it takes the focus off of my experience now and puts it in a different level, a different realm. The Bible says uh, heaven will be a place where there's no more tears or pain or crying or death. Okay, so if, if that's true, then the hope is, is that these things will be resolved and that, that we'll understand or we'll have more clarity that we don't have now. The greatest hope is, is that one day I'll walk with her in heaven. She'll be perfect. And I'll be full of joy. And this life will have made a lot more sense. Because sometimes it doesn't, but I have that hope. Philosopher and atheist Bertrand Russell once said, no one can sit at the bedside of a dying child and still believe in God. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a pretty strong argument against the existence of a loving God. But as Christian philosopher William Lane Craig has pointed out, what is Russell going to say when he's kneeling at the bed of the dying child? Too bad? I'm sorry? That's the way it goes? You see, as an atheist, Russell has nothing else to offer, because if there is no God, then we're all trapped in a world filled with senseless and unredeemable suffering, with absolutely no hope of deliverance from evil. But for the Christian, God does exist. Evil and suffering can result in a greater good, and there is hope and meaning for the future, because life doesn't end in the grave. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. Suffering is in this world because sin is in this world. And if God were to get rid of sin, he'd have to get rid of sinners. I think he's delaying closing the curtain on suffering, sin, Satan, until more people have time to hear about the good news of Jesus. And if my being in this wheelchair a little bit longer provides the time and opportunity for others to come into the kingdom, then my wheelchair's worth it. My affliction is just light and momentary, and I, I don't mind waiting. Now that offer of mercy will not be extended forever. There's going to be a, come a time when he says, enough, and then he's going to deal with it, and then true justice will be done perfectly. But this is not what we want, really. We don't want justice. We want mercy. And for now, mercy is what's being extended, and this is why you see the continuation of evil. There is so much we don't know about evil, pain, and suffering that many times I think we're people groping in the dark trying to make sense out of it. But God gives us enough to see to help us to keep on going and to redeem the pain and suffering we have so it doesn't defeat us.
If all I was looking at for the evidence of God was just the problem of evil, sure, I'd say, gee, that's a no-brainer. There is no God. He would never allow these kinds of things. But when I see all the other evidence in other areas for the existence of God and for a good God and a loving God, a God that cares about his creation, who's involved in his creation, well, then that helps put this particular question a little bit more into perspective. But I'll be the first one to admit it's emotionally difficult. I think most Christians go through a sense of deep puzzlement, which can come sometimes once in somebody's life, sometimes a thousand times in somebody's life, of, I really thought God was going to enable such and such to happen, and it hasn't happened. And so, yes, we can have huge disappointments, but the God to whom we go back, and on whose door we beat and we say, what on earth is going on here, is the God who says, remember what I have been through, remember the story of my son. One of the worst things that was ever done in the world was done to the best man that ever walked on the earth. So again, when we put it into the light of Jesus and what happened to him, do bad things happen to good people? What's it all about? It's very strange, but somehow God holds that within his purpose and will bring good out of it and through it. Sometimes when we suffer, we're just hoping somebody will give us the formula, how to fix it. What's the step one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D? Show me what to do, I'll do it. And, and God blows all that to smithereens. He lobs a hand grenade into the middle of it all and, and explodes it. He won't let us approach suffering with our own agenda. We've gotta to come to him empty-handed, blessed are the poor in spirit, I don't have the answers, God. And when we come to him like that, completely defenseless, and approaching him without a technical, fix-it, mechanistic approach to life, okay, I've got the formula, I know the answers, then we find God to be the answer. We can face anything if we know God is there in the midst of it all. I examined the biblical view of evil and suffering for many months, and honestly, I think I could spend the rest of my life trying to understand it all. The questions can be brutally difficult, and the answers are not quick, and they're not easy. Is Christian theology a satisfying explanation for the suffering in the world? Yes, I believe it is. Does it always offer immediate and total comfort when we hurt? No, not always. But if we come to God in faith, I believe he gives us legitimate reasons for hope that can carry us through the most difficult circumstances of our lives. How could a loving God allow evil and suffering? And why would he offer only a single pathway to salvation? They are demanding questions of undeniable significance. And for many, the answers are found in the life of a carpenter from Nazareth who calmed the seas and died to redeem the world from its sin. But for some, there are no satisfying explanations, only doubts and objections to the Christian faith. There is a profound sense of loss when anyone abandons a belief system they've held since childhood. I was a teenager when I became a Christian, and I wasn't equipped to challenge the ideas of my friends and mentors. At first, I accepted the beliefs of the people around me. But slowly and against my will, my doubts deepened until my faith languished and died. Those years of indecision were the most troubling and trying of my life. I found myself rethinking the story of Jesus of Nazareth, and for all its intrinsic fascination, it just wasn't the same. It was as if someone I loved had died. You grieve the loss because no one in history has touched the hearts of men and women the way Jesus did. He had the highest moral standard and the greatest compassion of any person I've ever heard of, and his wisdom was unsurpassed. Everything good and decent and pure that I know, I learned from Jesus. And if I may put it this way, 
I miss him. On June 7th of 2001, Charles Templeton died in Toronto, Canada. For me, the news brought back strong memories of his life and his struggle with Christianity, especially his objections to the existence of evil and Jesus' claim to be God. A year before his passing, I completed the manuscript of my book, The Case for Faith. I sent him a copy and included a letter wishing him well and encouraging him to keep an open mind toward the evidence for Jesus. I knew his doubts were heartfelt and not easy to reconcile, but I believe God could give him satisfying answers and that ultimately Christianity could stand up to his toughest objections. Before I sealed the envelope, I added a postscript, a promise from scripture that had helped me when I'd struggle with doubts of my own. I wrote, Chuck, I hope you'll take to heart the words of Proverbs 2. If you scream for insight and call loudly for understanding, if you search it out as you would hit to you, then the Lord will be awesome to you and you will come into possession of the knowledge of God.